Praise God. Well, we're, look, we're going to, uh, last week we talked about the glory of God, amen, the last uh, Wednesday, and how we talked about the fact that Adam lost his connection to the glory of God and, and how uh, it made him feel, feel fearful and he felt naked because of the fall. So he felt like he was lost and separated. Uh, but we also learned uh, about the glory of God that connected to God's glory is splendor and, and connected to God's glory is light. And uh, through the progression of God's plan, he has brought us closer and closer uh, through Jesus. Amen. He's bringing us closer and closer to glory. Like the word of God says that we're being changed from glory to glory. Amen. And we also learned towards the end of the teaching that that Jesus, he told the father in his prayer, you know, John 17. We talk about the Lord's prayer uh, that comes out of Matthew 7. But it, and that was when he was teaching his disciples to pray, which actually I'm going to start a series on prayer uh, starting on Sunday. But that the Lord's prayer is when he said, when his disciples said, teach us to pray, Lord. And he said, our father who art in heaven. Amen. But the Lord's prayer himself is actually in John 17, whenever he's about to go to the cross and he goes to the Lord in prayer himself and he prays for the disciples. Amen. And uh, part of what he says in that prayer is that I've given the glory that you gave to me. I'm, I'm giving to them. He's, and so what? I, that's good news. Amen. And so if you're born again tonight, praise God. And if you're not born again, you just need to call on the name of Jesus because you. And, and But look, whenever, whenever God, whenever you do give your heart to the Lord, the, the word of God is teaching that he's depositing his presence on the inside of you. Amen. That's what the word of God teaches in John 14, that when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. And the Holy Spirit, the presence of God is directly connected to the glory of God. And so when you get saved, the presence of God, the glory of God now is resident on the inside of you. Now, interestingly, I didn't really have this in my notes, but the Lord showed me this a long time ago that just as in the Old Testament, how the tabernacle, you know, you had the Levites and they would tear the tabernacle down. And the Lord said, look, whenever I'm going to send my pillar of cloud by day and my pillar of fire by night. And whenever the glory cloud starts to move, then, then you then you move. Amen. And um, and just as the tabernacle, it was had to house the glory of God it housed the presence of God beyond the veil in the holy of holies where the Lord would meet with Israel upon the mercy seat between the cherubim. Amen. And now you and I praise God are like a tabernacle. We're like the old Testament tabernacle in the sense that the Holy spirit lives in us. If you're born again, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. The Holy spirit moves in and he starts changing things. Praise God. And you may not know this, but look, you are a perfect opportunity for somebody's life. Like, in other words, everywhere you go, there's an opportunity really for a miracle to happen. All sorts of miracles. People can get touched. People can get healed. People can hear the truth of the gospel as you begin to release the glory of God out of your life. Amen. You might think, well, preacher, I'm not ready for that. Well, we've all been in different stages of our life. We've all been in different seasons of our life. I'm just wanting to encourage you to let you know that if you're saved tonight, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And God wants to use you in that way. Amen. You just wait on the Lord. You keep seeking after God and the Holy Spirit will do the work in you and he's going to release his his presence through you. He's going to use you. Amen. And, and as we begin to experience more and more of the glory of God and we start looking more like Jesus and less like us. And that's a good thing. And, you know, I used the word I made up a word called metamorph. You know, we get metamorphed, meaning we're being conformed into the image of Christ. There were pr three places in the last message where the word, it wasn't really the word metamorphosis, it's the Greek metamorphio, but it's where we get our English word metamorphosis, it, where they were used. And one was when Jesus was transfigured. Do you remember that? So Jesus was transfigured. He was metamorphed. Right. Where the, de the deity that was resident on the inside of Jesus, you know, he never stopped being God. Amen. But he was manifest as a man upon earth. Amen. Because he came to make right with the last Adam, the first Adam, I'm sorry, with the first Adam made wrong, the last Adam came to make right. And so Jesus never stopped being deity. He never stopped being God. At the same time, he did not manifest himself on earth 
as God. He healed as a man through which the Holy Spirit ministered and flowed through him. And I, so I got good news for you. You can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's what the word of God says. I believe that. I'm starting to believe it more and more. And it's not my responsibility to heal. It's my responsibility to believe God and to begin to step out in faith. And not that they would just be healed physically, but that they would be healed emotionally and that they would be healed spiritually. Because you know, like one preacher said, you can give them a biscuit today, and but they're going to be hungry again tomorrow. More. So if I give them a biscuit, but I don't give them Jesus, I really haven't helped them. And it's the same thing, as crazy as it sounds. If I pray for somebody's swollen ankle and don't give them Jesus, oh man, their ankle might not be sprained anymore. But hallelujah, what about their soul? You think you think a sprained ankle hurts? Oh, Amen. you don't want an eternity in hell, my friend. That's painful. That's heartache. Amen. That's sorrow. Amen. Amen. But praise God. You know, I just want you to know that Jesus, hallelujah, he had the glory in him and the glory of God manifest out of him. Praise God. And look, we are being changed into the image of Christ. Amen. From glory to glory. And the, the, the Holy Spirit wants the glory of God to be manifest in our lives. And the closer we get to him, praise God, the more people begin to see Jesus. Amen. And in the third place, was Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and in Romans 12 verse 1 it says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service I love that scripture I use it a lot whenever I speak and preach you know that word but the word that stuck out to me tonight or earlier was present it means to place a person or thing at one's disposal. And I was thinking, Naya was telling me this story. I'll probably put it somewhere else in here, but I was, Naya was telling me this story about somebody that used to worship up in the balcony at Family Worship Center. And she said this guy was pretty intense and he grabbed, he'd act like he had a, he, like he'd pull his sword out of his scabbard <laughs> and he'd do this number here, like he was cutting a, a veil or something. He'd spread it. And then he'd step in there and then he'd start like, you know, worshiping the Lord. Seems a little bit different. I'm not necessarily recommending that we, but you, you worship the Lord however you want to. But I was thinking about that, you know, to present a, to, to place a person or thing at one's disposal. And I was thinking about the idea of showing up to the Lord and saying, present and accounted for, sir. Yeah. I'm here for your service. I'm presenting myself at your disposal, Father, to be used by you, amen, for the kingdom of God. Because you see, Jesus, the word who was God, became man and laid down his life, yeah. amen. He laid down his life as a sacrifice and he paid the penalty for our sin. Yes. Exposure and faith in this truth. If you have been exposed to this truth and if you have put faith in this truth, if you've believed it from your heart, you have become a new creation in Christ. Right. Amen. And when you become a new creation in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And now it's your responsibility as a child of God. If you're a child of God, I'm, I'm trying to just tell you in a synoptic version what the Bible says. Every time I try to stand behind this pulpit, I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says if you're a new creation in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And now the Word of God says for you to present yourself. Now, and listen, he didn't even say it's extravagant. He said it's your reasonable service. After all, God the Father bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. Right. He gave His Son... Amen. To die on the cross. And now when you heard it, if you received Jesus and the Holy Spirit came to live in you, it's your, he brought you alive from the dead. Yes. Amen. I don't know about you. I don't know if you feel like you're alive from the dead. I know he brought me alive from the dead. And I'm so thankful that he brought me alive from the dead. So that's really what I want to do. I don't know if I want to pull an imaginary sword out, but I'm like... I want to be like president and accounted for, sir. Yeah. I'm here to work at your disposal. I'm, I'm here to receive my marching orders. I'm ready to, to, do, the, to do the work of the Lord. Amen. 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 You, know, to, to, you know, I started thinking it's our reasonable service to present ourselves, to make ourselves available to do his work. Amen. 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 I, I got to be honest with you. That doesn't mean that you have to keep the nursery. 
Okay, I'm gonna go through this little list here. It doesn't mean you have to keep the nursery. It doesn't mean you have to clean the church or help with children's ministry. Because really, and truly, in my opinion, as a pastor, most ministry needs to be done outside the walls of this church. And that's what I really believe with all of my heart. With everything that's in me, most ministry needs to be done out there. Where we take the love of God, where we take the glory of God that he's placed in us, and we go out there and we let them know. We plant seeds in their hearts, and we see their lives change. Now, at the same time, if we're going to have a church, there are things that need to be done. I mean, we could have a church that doesn't have a nursery. I mean, that's a pop, that's an option. I mean, that's how they did it back in the old days, right? Anybody that's been in church for any length of time, it, you, like back in the gap, we didn't have nursery like that. And back in the day, we didn't have children's ministry. And we didn't really, didn't, some small church, they don't have youth ministry. Like, so, you know, and now I don't know how that works. And that, that doesn't work for a church that's trying to like, grow in numbers because most people are looking I'll be honest with you if God grows numbers I'm okay that's great but not based upon some plan or some program I want God to grow the church based upon the fact that people's lives are being changed and people are being uh, people are being ministered to amen and even if you only end up with about 40 people in your church if you got about 15 of them that are all fire for the Lord and are willing to go out there and tell people about Jesus we'll get more done in a community with 15 people on fire for Jesus than what you could with a thousand people in the church that are just self-serving and only want to do their own thing I believe that Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. But if you have a child, you probably like it whenever your kids can go to children's ministry. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Anyway, just think about those people that serve in the church that way because we don't have that many of them. Praise God. It's easy for us to forget about them. They're just tucked away in a corner somewhere. Yeah. Praise, Praise God. They probably need some help sometimes. Amen. Well, hallelujah. That's another thing for another day, another topic. Amen. You know, but in verse two, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where the word comes in. Metamorph, be metamorph, be met, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I put a little list in here. Hope this doesn't irritate anybody. But how much time is spent watching regular TV? How much time is spent listening to secular music? How much time is spent in carnal conversation? How much time is spent in God's word? And how much time is spent in God's presence? I think those are some legitimate questions to ask in the church. I'll leave. I mean, I'm not asking you to answer them for me. I'm just trying to throw that out there. I think that those are some legitimate questions to ask in a church where there's people that love God and love to worship God and love the presence of God. Because you see, God has given us a portion of his glory. And let me say this. It's a treasure. What the kingdom of God is like a pearl of great promise. Amen. The kingdom of God is like a treasure that was found in a field. And when that man found that treasure, you know what he did? He's like, okay, let me cover this back up. Let me sell everything. Let me buy this field so that I can have this treasure. So, see, when the treasure of God enters on the inside of your heart, it is a precious thing to be one who has the presence of God on the inside of him. You know, one of the things that I've learned, and I hope that this is okay to say this, is, you know, because sometimes you, you think your words might come across the wrong way. But I've learned something that is presence. It can be practiced, meaning practicing the presence of God, like entering into the presence of God. Listen, I don't need a show of hands, but I wonder how many people really have. I think I'm using some words from my message on Sunday, too. But how many people have really entered in? To the presence of God and really practice the presence. If you have, then you're then you're feeling kind of. I mean, I'm not trying to use verbiage like that, but you're feeling kind of chill right now. Like you're like, that's me, preacher. I've entered into the presence of the Lord plenty of times. I've learned. I've learned how to tarry. I've learned how to pray. I've learned. I, I've, I've experienced the presence of God. I've, I've experienced the Spirit of God minister to my heart. I know. I know what you're talking about. And if you have it, and I keep talking about it. There's the possibility it's going to start to irritate you. 
especially if I start talking about prayer. And Sunday I'm going to be talking about prayer. So I'm just kind of like letting you know if it starts to irritate you, I'm just giving you a free warning. I've felt that before. I have felt that before. That's why I can talk about it. Because you see, when you don't spend much time in prayer and somebody starts talking about spending time in prayer, all of a sudden it starts to, and can I tell you that that's not the spirit of God doing that to you? <laughs> that's your, that's the flesh. And that, and that's demonic spirits getting you aggravated in your flesh. They like, they like poking your flesh because see, they don't want me to say that. And, 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 and they don't want you to concede to that. Because see, if you start saying, you know what? No, you lying devil. I don't like the way you make my flesh feel. You want to try to tell me what to do? And you're like, matter of fact, I'm going home tonight. And I'm going to get in the closet. And I'm going to get on my knees. And I'm going to get along with God. Because guess what? I'm not going to let you irritate my flesh. He don't want you to do that. So he wants to get you irritated. He wants to get you mad at the preacher. But I'm telling you right now, if you'll start getting along with the Lord, start getting intimate with God, some beautiful things right. will start happening. Amen. His presence will begin to do a work in your heart and in your life. Amen. Amen. Listen, we got to learn to practice his presence because there's coming a day on the other side. Of the seven year deal, whenever that comes, is this, is that Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. I'm just going to read it fast. It says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's going to be a time in the millennial reign of Christ whenever a child will be able to put their hand on a snake, a viper's hole, where, where a lion will eat straw like an ox, where a wolf and a lamb will be able to lie down together in green pastures because the knowledge of the Lord is going to fill the earth. The glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth. If you forgot what I'm preaching on tonight, I'm preaching on the glory of the Lord again and how it can change a life how it can change my life, amen, and how now that you have given your heart to the Lord, the glory of God is on the inside of you. That's right. And it gets even better because during that time, he says that we also will receive a glorified body. But you know what? This is what I want you to know. <laughs> as he's filled us up, as we get into the word of God, as we spend time in prayer, as we practice his presence, as his presence ministers to us, and, and, and he becomes he becomes more in us than us. Oh, that's a yes, good thing. Yes, yes. When he becomes more in us than, I don't know about you, but if you've been serving the Lord for a while, that ought to sound right. Yes. But if there'd be more Jesus in me than Matt Abed, <laughs> that would be a good thing. Amen. Yes. And, and listen to this. There's a world of atoms out there. What, what you talking about? A world of people that have only been born once, meaning Adam lost the glory. He, he felt naked. He felt, he felt separated from the presence of the Lord. And they're naked without, these people out there are naked without the glory of God. They're hurting and they're sick. They're sick physically, spiritually, emotionally. And Jesus can heal them. And, and, and the question is, and even to people in the house of God. No, really, I've been, I was thinking about this earlier today. Will, will we be made whole? Uh, listen, I can tell you when I first came into the faith, Listen, for so long, I was a sickly child. I was born, I must have had tubes in my ears three to four times. I've been to the ENT so many times, it's not even funny. I remember when I first got saved, I, I was like 17, 18 years old, having a little bit of the old job and spending half my check. I gotta go to the ENT, I got something wrong with me. And still going to the doctor left and right. You know what, by the grace of God, I am mean, I practice medicine now, but I ain't trying to go to no doctor's office unless I'm going to see a patient. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I try to avoid doctor's offices. <laughs> And I think that that's a good, that's a good plan. Oh, well, you got yourself in trouble. No, not really, because I'll tell them to. I try to avoid doctors all the time. And by the grace of God, hallelujah, keep us safe, Lord. Keep us yes. well, because, yes. because your presence is the best medicine yes. than anybody. Yes. You know what? No, I had a spirit of fear on me. I had a spirit of infirmity that was connected to a spirit of fear on me at 18 years old. And when the Lord delivered me from that, praise God, I don't even know when he did it, but I'm so grateful 
And I don't want to go back to that. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So there's a whole world of atoms out there, though, in that they're hurting. And, and on the inside of you is the hope of Jesus. Amen. In the same way that Satan stole Adam's glory, he wants to steal every human opportunity to regain the glory of God that the last Adam made available for us. You know that. He, he wants to steal that opportunity because that's what he does. He's a thief. He says it, that the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus comes. He said, I'm the good shepherd. He said, I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Praise God, the good shepherd. I mean, that just, just resounded in my spirit today. I am the good shepherd. Yes. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You know, Satan can try to steal it from them. But the mystery of hope, it can be unlocked in our hearts. And it can be released out of us. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that. I can't get this out of my heart. The glory of God, the presence of God is on the inside of us. Jesus is on the inside of you, my friend. No, we need to get this in our head. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says this. That I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but he he, Jesus, lives in me. And now this life I live in the flesh, in this physical body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Jesus lives in me. And if I will believe that and give the Lord the opportunity, he will unlock that truth in my life and in my heart. And he will release himself out of me and into other people. Whenever I walk into their atmosphere, hallelujah, their atmosphere can be changed. Their destiny can be changed. Their families can be changed. I believe that. That's what he put us here for. He put us here to give him glory. Listen, he didn't put you here to become a good a nurse practitioner. That's your job. He didn't put you here to, to, have a, to be a roofer. He didn't put you here to, to be a teacher. That's your job. He put you here to give glory to God. He put you here to release the glory of God. Into the atom. That's you know that's what started this whole little two part series is is that G, the Lord Himself said in Numbers chapter twenty four, as surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Right. He's going to do it. The question is, are we going to be part of it on this side of the glory? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I know I want to be. I know I think some of y'all want to be. Amen. And we all got a part to play. You know, I don't, I don't want to get into Ephesians and the body of Christ, but I was thinking about this and I've been saying a little bit more lately. You know, uh, uh, a pinky don't work good on. A hand works a lot better if it has a pinky and a thumb. Say it. Come on. And a hand works better with a wrist that works, that's connected to a forearm and an arm. And, and, and feet work good with all the toes. You, you lose your big toe. I've never seen about hurt. It's hard to walk without a big toe. The point is, is that, man, I'm telling you right now, if the body of Christ would really get a hold of this and realize that God has gifted us and that in and, and various ways, then some of us multi-gifted, really, like works ministry. Works ministry is important. Uh -huh. I mean, really, like it's important to be able to have people that are willing to do things like that that are behind the scenes. Amen. But not just works ministry, people that sing, people that play music. But listen, we can be the best at what we want to do. But if we don't have the anointing, we ain't. We just play in church, my friend. So if we don't learn how to pray and we don't learn how to seek the face of God, we just play in church. Preachers that don't pray, and I've been one before, that wasn't praying like I should have been praying. You don't want a preacher that didn't pray. I'm telling you right now, because if you got a preacher that's not praying, you, you he's playing church too. And you just playing church, just sitting in there, we're just wasting our time. Lord, help us. Help us to get our heart and our head right, especially with the days that we're living in. I mean, it's so dark out there. Lord, help us. We can help them regain the glory that was lost in the first Adam, but regain in the last Adam. Because see, Colossians 127 says this, to whom... God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Paul, you know, listen, I didn't mean to break this scripture down like this, but there's been a mystery on the earth since the days of the garden. And Adam and Eve were expelled out of the garden wearing animal skin. There's been a mystery that's been brewing. And the mystery was revealed in the person of the Christ and the apostle Paul got the revelation.
revelation. And he's saying this is the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. The mystery of God since the fall is in you. Thank you, Jesus. The thief steals through deception. Paul warned in the second letter to the Corinthian church that Satan was going to try to deceive not only the world, but also the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 11. I'm sorry, verse 12 through 15. 2 Corinthians 11. Look how fast that was. That was great. Is that first or second? Second. Okay, cool. So let's read it. But what I do, that I will do. Huh? Yeah, that I will do. That I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. He's talking about false, false apostles. That wherein they glory. See, they're trying to get their own glory, right? They may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Don't marvel at this, Paul says. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. My point is that people are hurting. My point is that people are hurting. And they're full of stress and they're searching for answers. And God has showed up. And listen, I know your life's not perfect. Nobody's life in here is perfect. We all got our things that we're going through. But praise God, you got Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we found you. Thank you that you found us. And that you filled us with your spirit. Lord, and let us let us learn, church. Oh, I'm going to wait till Sunday to preach on prayer. Let us learn to get a hold of you. To grab a hold of you and to get to know you. And to be sensitive to your spirit and your voice. Yes, Praise God. Yes, Thank Lord. you, Lord. Paul's concern was that people would lose their purity just as Eve lost her purity. Because, see, Satan in his subtlety presents himself as an angel of light. That's what he says right here in, the, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 4. He says, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I espoused you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he comes preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or if you receive another spirit which you have not received. Or another gospel which you have not accepted. You might well bear with him. And listen. You know, it's easy to pick out something like Mormonism. Like, what you talking about, dude? You're going to be a god on a planet? Come on, man. Like, let's just sit down and talk about this. You know, some of these things are easy to pick out, but some things are not as easy to pick out. They preach a Jesus that's all love and there's not going to be any judgment. Like, hold on a second. That's not what the word says. He's long suffering. He's kind. He's tender. He's merciful. How you know, preacher? Because I know. And because I, I did things I shouldn't have done and I, I put it to the test even as I was as a believer and I'm not proud of it. Lord, forgive me. I know he's merciful. He's long suffering. But I'm telling you right now, there's coming a day where grace is going to run out, church. And, and, and people are going to people are going to face a, a true judgment. And, and that ought to really that ought to reach your heart. And if it's not, then maybe something's like not right with us. Maybe we've just gotten complacent in our walk. Maybe, maybe we, you know, I don't know. Maybe we've allowed the cares of the world or things to come into our lives. And we haven't been close and intimate with the Lord. Lord, help us. I mean, the days are growing dark. See, what we must understand is that Satan is well acquainted with the glory of God. We talked about it last week that the cherubim were closely associated with the glory of God. You can read about it in the book of Ezekiel. That the cherubim, that the, it's almost, and one, one of the Psalms says that the Lord rides upon the cherubim. <laughs> you know, and I mean, it, God doesn't need a cherubim to ride on. But the point is, is that the cherubim are a form of an angel and are very closely related to the presence of God. I mentioned that at the last Wednesday night, but we also taught on it on the Sunday morning. Remember with the mercy seat and the cherubim right. were on the mercy seat. And that's where God's presence dwells. Okay. <laughs> and. It says it right here that Moses, look at, look at Hebrews chapter 8, 
verses four through five that see there was a heavenly there was some there's heavenly tabernacle blueprints did you know that that in heaven there was some tabernacle blueprints this is what the lord told moses it says now it is or this is what the letter to the hebrew says now if he were on this is verse four hebrews eight verses four through five now if he were on earth talking about jesus he would not be a priest at all you know, really and truly, Jesus' priestly ministry, it really, really got kicked off once he died and, went, went and ascended into heaven and, seat, and was seated at the right hand of the Father and ever liveth to make intercession for us. But he, but he says, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything According to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. What, I'm, what is my point? My point is, is this, is that there was a heavenly blueprint. There was a heavenly tabernacle. And that Moses constructed the earthly tabernacle based upon that which was in heaven. And in the earthly tabernacle beyond the veil, there was an ark with a mercy seat that had two cherubim on it. The scripture teaches us, we can go to Ezekiel chapter uh, 28 verses we actually, well, let's just go ahead and, and go to 14 just to show you, and then we'll back up if we need to. This is what he's saying. This, he's, he's speaking this. This is what I believe. He's speaking this to the fallen angel. He says, you are the anointed cherub that covers. So he says, I have set thee so. You are upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You Look at this in verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of you with violence and you have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy you. Oh, covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. Look at that angel of light. By reason of your brightness, I will cast you to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold you. See, he was anointed cherub. He covered whatever it looks like over there in the presence of God. I guess him being able to be in the glory of God, him being able to be close to the presence of God wasn't good enough for him. He wanted his own glory. You know, the Bible warns believers. We got to, Paul warned us, don't think more highly of ourselves than what we are. If we're not careful, that same spirit of pride will jump on the inside of us. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. He says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You know, he destroyed his own position and access to God's glory by demanding his own glory and rebelling against God. You know, the Ephesians 6 teaches us that there's a hierarchy of evil. That we're in a war against principalities and powers. World rulers, spiritual wickedness in, in heavenly places. And they have a combined effort and they're trying to deceive and to weaken the nations. They have, they have a, they've been able to pull a quick one on the leaders of governments for thousands of years. See, just as Satan went and brought Jesus up on the mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the God, of, of the kingdoms of the earth, and Satan said, he said, see these kingdoms? They've been delivered to me. I know I said this recently, but I, don't, I think we need to remember. They've been delivered to me, and I give them to whomever I will. In the course of time, men have repeatedly been deceived by this liar, and there's a plan that's being engaged upon the earth to pull human souls away from the truth of God. We are living in the midst of it. I'm not planning on getting into it tonight, 
I'm telling you right now, we are living in the midst of it. I believe we're in the last of the last days. We need to get our heart right. And we need to, you know, the other day I shared a story, and I'm not going to say who their name was when we had that little meeting for Project Harvest. There was a person that we used to go to church with in Franklin, and uh, the guy's wife ended up with cancer on her tongue. And, 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 and by the time they found it, it was so late in the game. And I'll never forget after she passed away, the husband came back and he told us what happened in the hospital in the emergency room about a week, uh, about a week before she died. That whenever he brought her in there, because she was in so much pain that she couldn't, she couldn't really swallow her own spit anymore. And she was running around with a piece of paper and she was asking people, "Do, do you know my Jesus?" Do, do you know my Jesus? And she was frantically trying to get people to receive Christ. That was what she was concerned about in the last week of her life. Because she believed that God was real. And I don't know about you. I don't want to die like that. I believe God will heal me. I believe God will take care of me. I believe God will protect me. But if I do have to die, I want to die like that. Hallelujah. I want to die with my last breath trying to lead somebody to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And the enemy wants to steal God's glory. And he wants his own glory. And the enemy is trying to cause confusion and deception in the world. You know, I'm not going to turn to it because it's too long of a passage. But in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 15 through 19, the glory of the Lord departs from Israel. If you go and you read Ezekiel chapter 8 and then you connect it to Ezekiel chapter 10, what you begin to realize is that idolatry was in the temple. And the Lord said, look at this son of man. He brought, I love that passage in Ezekiel 8 because the Bible says that Ezekiel says, man, the Lord grabbed me up by the back of my, the locks of my hair. <laughs> it's like, come in with me, boy. Come take a look with me because I got to show you what these people are doing to me. He brings him to the temple and he lets him see. And he says, he said, he showed me the image of jealousy right there near the North Gate, right there by the altar. He said, look what they're doing. They're trying to make me leave my own house. Look what my people are doing to me. They're trying to make me leave my own house. And see, finally, after a period of time, in chapter 10, the glory of God does depart. He won't stay in an unclean environment forever. Now, thank God the preacher's not the one that says when he leaves. Amen. And thank God he didn't leave when the preacher wasn't ready for him to leave. Amen. Uh, but we need to understand that. That that's the enemy's plan to try to get us to play around. With things that are gonna be that are unclean and that are gonna that are gonna make the Lord feel uncomfortable because He's holy. And the Holy Spirit does not want to live in the midst of that. Listen, I'm gonna close with this psalm. Maybe the musicians can come up. This is Psalm chapter 24. I love this psalm. It's kind of long, but as they're getting together, uh, <laughs> Charles Wesley, I don't know, I thought his sisters wrote this, but anyway. Well, not, they didn't write the psalm. I thought they wrote a hymn connected to the psalm. <coughs> this is a good psalm, a good psalm for us to read before we, before we go out worshiping the Lord. Amen? Amen? It says right here, the earth is the Lord's. This is verse 1. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's. I can really preach this. And this earth belongs to the Lord. Amen? It doesn't belong to that lion devil. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him. That seek thy face. O, J o Jacob. Selah. <laughs> Lift up your head. This is the part I want you to see right here. So he's, you know. The city of Jerusalem is the city of peace. We've talked about that. That's what it means. Shalom. Okay. The city means peace. Whenever the king of, of peace is not in there. Okay. Then there's no peace. And we're going to pray for Jerusalem, but until the Prince of Peace returns, there will be no peace. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry, there will be a peace that's going to try to mimic and act like it's coming, but it ain't the peace that we're looking for. 
And so don't buy it because it's not going to be true right. uh, according to the word of God. But, but, but look, the heads and gates, he's talking, to the, he's talking to the doors and the gates of the wall to the city. There's two different times that this could be talking about. One, whenever David brought the Ark of the Covenant back after it had been gone. But this is likely talking about whenever Solomon built the new temple. Okay, and they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant in. But look, whenever Jesus come riding in on a donkey, they don't really want him. Right? And so the king has, but there's coming a day that he's coming. But I want you to also understand this. He's looking for to come into your heart. And, and so I'm, whenever I'm reading this, I'm singing in my heart to you and I'm singing in my heart to me. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be you lifted up, you everlasting doors. Look at this. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Be ye lift up the everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? He's the Lord, strong and mighty. He's the Lord, mighty in battle. You need the Lord to go to, to war for you. Are you are you dealing with a, a problem in your life? Do you have people coming against you? Is the enemy trying to destroy your family? Come on. The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O oh you gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Our God is a man of war, and he will go to war for us, and he will protect his glory, and he will protect his glory in you. Let's give him glory and honor because he's worthy tonight. Amen.